our way. Straight like Vietnam, to tell you the truth, because you're either, you're either going to be a gangster or, or you're going to be a crackhead. There were, there were shootings daily. There were stabbings daily. There were robberies daily. I, can, I cannot drive down a street in this city without saying that one particular gang or another claims it as, as their neighborhood or, or their turf. While Dre was growing up in the midst of this gang culture, he was attending Centennial High School, where, by all accounts, he was a good student. The school's location, however, resulted in Dre being exposed to unimaginable levels of violence and intimidation from both sides of the gang fence. It pitted guys who went to school together against each other. Centennial is in the middle of a blood and a crip neighborhood. Well, when I went to Centennial, I knew blood, I knew, knew blood, I knew Crips. I never was in a game. I knew guys from both sides of the fence. I could go on either side of the canal and hang out. When, when crack came along, oh shit, you barely went to school. A drive-by shooting that happened here where a member of the Santana Block Crips, who was the Atlantic Drive Crips and the Kelly Park Crips' mortal enemy, came over here with an AK-47 and he drove by while the park was full. Of, filled with kids and families having picnics, but there were some gang members there and he sprayed into the crowd and he, he killed two people and shot a eight month pregnant female and the baby died. And I can remember, that's one incident that, that always stand out in my mind whenever I go past Kelly Park. Music and sports occupied a lot of Dre's time and kept him away from bad influences. Because at that time, which was 88, 87, everybody was dying. Like the gang explosion was just humongous. Like it was cool to be a gangster in 88. You know what I mean? So uh, most of the people from that era got somebody they know that died. Well, I'll put this way here. The, the guy who turned me on to Dre is dead. His best friend is doing 25 to life. Most of the guys in my neighborhood over here uh, have serious. Uh, either dead or in jail. Very simple. Now I'm a beatbox for these cats to get down. As a DJ, Dre first called himself Dr. J after one of his favorite basketball players, Los Angeles Laker Julius Dr. J. Irving. He found music, and, and that's, that's, what, that's probably the only reason he's living. Tell you the truth. I don't give a damn in my cyber no discussion. You know what I mean? Or you're gonna find that avenue, which is probably sports or music to get, you know, which that's that's the only get like outlet in the ghetto anyways. You either gotta be a, a sports star or a music star. He he has to be an inspiration. He grew up in this type of environment, he's a multimillionaire. He's Horatio Alger in the flesh. He came from nothing, and and he's something now. In America, everybody can do it. He's a, he's a success story. Play him out. I knock him out like Mickey Mantle out of the park. I thought it was strange he had so many kids. He had like three kids at 17. I thought that was just, huh? Like you. Oh, God, my uh -huh. He had three kids at 17. And, you know, I thought that was kind of strange. I'm like, man, what are you thinking about? Okay. I'll I, I, I get it straight. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Okay, cool. Let's make some music, you know? It's all bluffing. I serve nigga like chicken or egg McMuffins. Egg McMuffins. Oh, but yet the chicken with the biscuits. You want to battle hardware, don't risk it. Because I'm not a brisket. You can't burn me. Better get an attorney. Have them falling on a gurney. In the early 80s, Lonzo Williams landed a regular gig at a new Compton nightclub, Eve After Dark. On Fridays, he would spin records from 9 till 5 the next morning, turning the crowd over three or four times. To share the load, Lonzo built a team of DJs called Disco Construction. Then, as Disco died, he formed the world-class Wrecking Crew to cater for the emerging new 80s R&B sound, which at the time included favorites Donna Summer, George Clinton, and Prince. When I first heard about Dre, it was from a friend of mine named Timmy. 
I got a little RIP, he's dead now. Timmy was telling about this guy from the neighborhood that was real talented. He could mix, he could outmix anybody in the club. And first of all, he pissed me off when he said that, okay, because I figured I had the tightest jacks in the, in the city. The Eve After Dark was gully, it was grimy, it was the hood, it was, it was our thing in the hood. The young Dre started hanging around outside the Eve. Although the club didn't serve alcohol, Lonzo ran a strict over 18's age policy to fend off heat from the increasingly restless LAPD. Dre was 17 and still a student at Centennial High. But as a three-year DJ veteran, this didn't stop him from trying to get into the club. Dre was desperate to show the crowds what he could do. And he and Easy e would come and hang out on the front steps and beg me to come in the club. I mean, they would beg me, hey man, can I get in, can I get in? No, hell no. Primarily, they couldn't get in because they never would dress right. They always wore the tennis shoes and the jeans. And at that time, the whole dress code for the city was totally different than what it is right now. And uh, Tim, I told Tim, I said, man, you guys, too young, Dre was 17, he said, we were 18 and over. He's too young, he don't dress right, I ain't having it, okay? So somehow or another, one day I looked up, and Dre came in a nice little skinny tie and nice baggy pants and shoes. There were a lot of marijuana, girls, alcohol, you know, pistols falling on the floor, guns, red rags, because it was a, a blood area. To this day, I don't recall giving anybody permission to let him on the turntables. All I know, one day I looked up and there he was and he was doing his mix that he had perfected. And it was Planet Rock over Mr. Postman, which are two records that uh, mathematically should not be mixed together. But because of the 1200s and his practicing, he made them match up completely perfect. And it was just, it was astonishing. It had, people stopped dancing just to look. And I, I got a crowd of people looking at, watch this guy do this. And so eventually, you know, he kind of slid his way into the crew. And that's how, that's, how I first got his, that's how he first got my attention. The people that conducted business there at the Eve After Dark wanted Dre, they knew him locally because he lived in the area, to be the DJ. But it was, it was a thing for the hood. You know, Wednesday nights, you know what I'm saying, Friday nights, going there and it was like our thing. You go in there and have fun. Where you see the curtains right now and the tables were, that was our main stage for the DJs, okay? And Although we originally started off back here in the back, where the curtains are back here, it was actually an enclosed booth, and we kind of liked that. The room here holds like 300 people. We'd have anywhere from six to 700 people here. This, it was the dance floor, and I mean, this whole, actually no, that wasn't dance The whole room was a dance floor, okay? To be honest with you, the whole room was a dance floor. If the fire marshal ever knew how many folks I had here on any given night, I'd still be in jail, okay? Dre now had a regular spot DJing at the Eve. As their relationship developed, Dre and Lonzo soon became firm friends. And it was kind of, it was fun to hang around with, except when it came to driving. Because when he, when he, I, I think he's, what you call it, narcolepsy, narcolepsy, when he fall asleep, you know, you just be riding, <laughs> he couldn't pull out the driveway, he'd be knocked out, okay? And we, me, I was always rolling, and I always like to have a have a have a riding buddy with me, okay? And he was little to no company, because he'd always get in the car before you hit the driveway. <laughs> He's knocked out, wake up, oh, we, we, you know, no company whatsoever. But he, that's another story, okay? Girls say he was cute. I never thought of him being a cute brother, man. You know, he kind of funny looking at myself, but girls always loved him. You know, women, something about, you know, he was just, women find him attractive. And he was always real suave, you know, he had that, he had that Billy D thing going for him from time to time. I mean, he was a fun cat to hang out with, because, you know, when he was awake, he was a pretty fun cat to hang out with, because he always had something funny to say, he, uh, he'd always, he'd always, he's always known for doing dumb shit, you know, like, why would you do that? Oh man, it was just something to do, you know, he, he was, it was, he was like, he was a daredevil, he was always, um, he had a real give a fuck attitude, like, you know, fuck it, you know, I did it, you know, what the hell? Watching him work three or four women was like something you could just get some popcorn and just have a ball with. It, it, I've seen situations where Dre have a girl in the studio, one in the house, one out front, and one around the corner watching all three of them, okay? It, it was, I mean, it was ridiculous. 
I mean, I spent a lot of time juggling women for him, running, running interference, like playing football. All right, you go watch, talk to someone, so keep her busy. To, I'll be, by, you know, we, we're all helping him out, trying to keep him from getting busted. Yeah, Dre by now had become a member of the World Class Wrecking Crew, one of the West Coast's earliest rap crews. He and his crewmates combined funk and hip-hop, which at the time was considered revolutionary. Dre put out a single called Dr. Dre's Surgery on his own record label and miraculously sold an estimated 50,000 copies. 